uh, are we on? We're on. Are we on? We're on. Oh, we're on. <laughs> well, I guess we're on. So uh, I, I guess we'll we'll do the thing. Should we do the thing? Let's do the thing. Okay. Set us up to do the thing. <laughs> sure thing. Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. It can only mean one thing. It is time for Mission Log Live. I'm Allison Pitt. And I'm John Champion. And Allison, welcome to the show. All the way from Daily Star Trek News right here on the Roddenberry Podcast Network. Thank you so much for having me, John. Uh, it was a really long journey here. I walked yes. from one side of the house to mm -hmm. a different side of the house, and now I'm here. Well, you went to the side of the house that has Star Trek posters behind you. That's really the yeah, I did. Yeah, thing. it was yeah. Nor normally I'm in my closet. <laughs> I normally record in my closet, so now I have come out of my closet and I'm here with you guys. So I really like that. I like the whole like the the collage going on back there with motion picture very prominent behind you. This all looks excellent. Yeah, thank you very much. I take no credit for it. This was actually this was actually this was from. Because I used to do Priority One, a Roddenberry Star Trek podcast, and we used yes. to go live. This was right before our show tonight, um, and this was the backdrop that I had for that show. And I don't get a lot of chances to use it these days, so uh, thank you for giving me an excuse to bring it out of storage. Well, I'm so glad that you're here, and uh, I, I think everybody is glad to have you here, and thank, thank you for joining us for our special guest. Um, listen, for all of you folks who are watching or listening later, if you want to learn a thing or two about Star Trek's visual effects, uh, then you've just got to meet our guest tonight. That's all there is to it. Coming up in a few minutes, Dan Curry will be here live with us, ready to hear your questions and comments and tell us all about creating those magnificent visuals that give life to the Star Trek universe. Now, Dan has done so much with Star Trek, and we want to know what you want to know. And we can make that really easy. Just click on the Zoom link, use the one tap from your smartphone, or you can call us at 669-900-6833. Then enter the meeting code you'll see on screen and in the show notes. Once again, that number is 669-900-6833, or you can simply click on the Zoom meeting link so we can see your smiling face. And speaking of smiling faces, I'm assuming that they're smiling. Uh, let's say hi to the people who are in the chat. These are all the people who will be calling into us later or clicking on the Zoom link. But right now, they're typing away. Uh, there's Chris Riker. There's Casey. There's Evan. Uh, there is Carlos. There's John. There's so many Johns. Uh, there's uh, Karen. There's David. There's Alan. Uh, there's Scott Palm. What up, Scott Palm? Uh, there's Josh. There's uh, another John. So many Johns. There's Tate. Uh, there's Chuck. Uh, there's Matt. There's Alan. Did I say Alan? Who knows? Giving Alan a second shout out. So welcome to everybody. Oh, there's Aaron. There's Peter. Uh, welcome to everybody who is joining us here live. Of course, if you're not joining us live and you're joining us later, that's fine too. Just hit like click share, do the thing, tell us that you love us, because honestly, that's the only way that I can validate my <laughs> existence. So, oh, John. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, that's, <laughs> I, I know, I know it's a sad existence, right? But thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. There's Michael right now saying, hi, John and Allison. Hi, back to you, Michael. Pleasure to see you all. And, and other John, John X, he is very excited. Just Dan Curry, exclamation point. He is very into this. So that John needs to be calling in. So uh, thanks, everybody, and uh, we look forward to our chat tonight. Now, as always, before we get going with our guest, uh, a few orders of business to take care of. We want to talk about things that are coming up on our various shows and across the network. Uh, and, and speaking of which, well, we have somebody from another Roddenberry show here tonight. Allison, of course, representing daily Star Trek news. Now, for any of, those, you, any of those of you who do not already download and regularly subscribe to Daily Star Trek News, so easy, could not be easier. You go look up Daily Star Trek News, you hit subscribe, you download it, and then every day you get Daily Star Trek News. For me, I love it because it's like 10 minutes-ish, and you get all the headlines that you need to know, plus some fun stuff, some trivia, some history, upcoming events. Uh, did I nail it? Is that is that DSTN in a nutshell? Yeah, I think I'm gonna have to uh, hire you to do, <laughs> to do my promos. That was great. Yeah, no, that's exactly what the show is. It's a it's a it's a ten minute shot of all of the Star Trek news that you need to know on a daily basis every weekday. 
And look, I, I, I don't want to bring us down. Uh, there's been a lot of news in the last couple of weeks, some of which we will talk about in a moment with our guest. Um, give us uh, just a handful of the, the highlights and, and some of the important, the heavy stuff too. Well, I'll start with the heavy stuff. And um, really, it's been a really, really hard week for Star Trek fans. If you've been uh, watching or listening to the news at all, we've lost a lot of um, prominent figures within the Star Trek world. Um, we lost DC Fontana last week. Uh, and, and over the weekend, we lost uh, Robert, uh, Robert Walker Jr., who was Charlie and Charlie X. And we also lost Rene Aubergenois on uh, Sunday as well. Um, and uh, another loss that you may have heard of, um, uh, Marina Sirtis' husband, who was not particularly in the public eye. His name was Michael Lamper. He was a musician. He also passed away on Saturday evening. So there's been a lot of people um, uh, mourning that impact on her as well. Yeah. Um, but uh, some interesting and industry news uh, in there as well. So oh, yeah, uh, yeah, a big south. one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Um, what day is today? Today uh, is the Tuesday. 10th. Yeah, so um, uh, middle of last week, Viacom and CBS are now Viacom CBS. Um, Priority One did a really great graphic of Tuvix with Viacom CBS <laughs> across his forehead. It was great. Um, yeah, so uh, for Star Trek fans, uh, there's some potentially really exciting news there. Um, and you'll be hearing more about that, you know, towards the end of this week on my show, uh, what that means for the franchise going forward as well. Okay. Uh, and you have fans in the audience because already Paul Wright is saying DSTN is awesome. Three exclamation points on that one. Please. So, thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Um, some things coming up in Mission Log World. Uh, well, this Thursday night, December 12th at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 Eastern. So we shifted this a little bit earlier. In Sansar, sansar.com, our uh, VR platform where we host the Roddenberry Nexus, we will have a tour with David C. Fine. Now, David was the producer on the director's edition of Star Trek The Motion Picture. He worked directly with Robert Wise on that director's edition. He has so many stories. He has so much insight. Um, if you can join us either in virtual reality or in desktop mode, you can do it for free. Go to sansar.com, sign up for your free account there, and then join us on uh, Thursday evening, 4.30 Pacific, 7.30 Eastern, to meet David in virtual space. Uh, you will need to do that on a PC running Windows 7 or above, and we hope to see you there. Uh, also, with Mission Log and Mission Log Live, a lot of people have been asking about the schedule. Uh, this Thursday, a special catch-up episode with Rod Roddenberry. Next Thursday, our interview with... John Delancey, Q himself. Uh, and then we have a little bit of time off for the Christmas break and New Year's break, but there is one more Mission Log Live coming up next week. We've got back-to-back -back Star Trek shorts, uh, the two new animated episodes that will be out. Uh, my guest host that night will be Claire Kramer. So please join us for our discussion of those episodes. And we, as always, would like your comments, your questions, your feedback on new Trek as it happens. Uh, so that'll catch up with Mission Log through the end of the year, and then we will come back uh, the first week of the year with a uh, special episode, uh, some live episodes, and then getting into DS9 Season 4. That's right around the corner. Uh, now, every week, Allison, we like to pose a poll question, very often inspired by our guest. Uh, last week, our guest uh, host was Josh from Shabam, and our special guest was Dr. Aaron McDonald. So we posed a science question. If you would like to do the honors and uh, share the results of that one. Uh, that's right. The question last week was, do you think most people get their science information from TV and movies? And a pretty overwhelming majority said yes at 77%. And the no's had just 23%. Um, personally, I think that's about right. Uh, especially yeah. if you're a Star Trek fan, because really, if you learn everything from science in Star Trek, then probably eventually you'll be right. 
that's, that's good. Yeah, there you go. So there I, I would go. say it should be 100%. <laughs> so you just have to be choosy about what that science is, you know. But yeah. I, I like the way that they phrase that question because, uh, uh, and I say they, Josh, and and we kind of ran it by Aaron and talked to Earl. And and the idea is we're, we're asking, do you think others get their science information from TV and movies? It's not about you. You may... Mm -hmm a variety of sources. We all do. But where do you think most people get their information? And I, I said, I just hope that people who are getting their science information from TV and movies are using that to inspire looking at real science, not just fiction, you know? So mm -hmm. who knows? Now this week, because we have Dan joining us, uh, pretty straightforward. I said, choose your weapon. Choose your Klingon weapon. You had a choice of a Batleth or a Mechleth. Overwhelming. Again, I'm not surprised. Bat left with 68%. Uh, mech left with 32%. Uh, I'm looking forward to going back and reading the comments on why people chose what they chose. I think one of the answers was just saying that the, the bat left is so iconic. Um, even if it wouldn't be practical for them, uh, but we were about to talk to the creator of that weapon. He can tell us all about its practicality or not. So without further ado, Let's meet Dan Curry. Now, Dan is the winner of seven Emmy Awards with a total of 19 nominations. He started with Star Trek, actually with Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. Allison, that's the one with the whales. Oh, the one with that. the whales. The one right. with the whales. That's right. Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. And uh, he joined Next Gen during its first season. From that point forward, uh, he was with the franchise through Next Gen, DS9, Voyager, and Enterprise. He's got a starship named after him. Heck, he even built it. And you might think that you're good at Klingon martial arts. Dan created Makbara. So you can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Dan. He knows a thing or two about Klingon martial arts. So, Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, well, you say that now. We just got started. <laughs> I, uh, I would love to know, uh, first of all, you know, you've you've worn a couple of hats on Star Trek. Uh, you have been a uh, second unit director. Uh, most people know that you were a visual effects supervisor, then a visual or visual effects producer, visual effects supervisor. Can you tell us just right off the bat for some who may not know the difference between special effects and visual effects? And what I'm interested in is kind of where those lines get blurry, where that crosses over. Uh, traditionally, uh, in times past, there was no difference between special effects and visual effects because everything was done uh, practical on set. And the studios did not like to have the public aware that visual effects even existed because they didn't want the audience to think anything was faked. Uh, but thanks to the wonderful work on Star Wars, uh, that uh, by Richard Edlin, John Dykstra, and of course, Dennis Buren, uh, it began to be respected as an art form in its own right. And special effects and visual effects are quite different. They're different departments with different skill sets. Special effects generally is practical ex effects or mechanical effects, and they would entail pyro, and you need a special license to do pyro, uh, and entails wire gags where things are pulled, magnet gags, uh, actors hanging on arbors, um, even the doors opening and closing on the Enterprise were controlled by special effects. A great guy named Will Toms would actually manually open and close the doors with a, a, a rope and a handle behind the doors. Um, visual effects implies uh, combining elements created separately into a new cinematic reality. So that might be actors on blue screen that are put into a new background, uh, space shots, which are ship shots separately or created separately on a computer. So uh, visual effects generally entails compositing of, of varied elements while special effects is stuff that happens live. Although uh, we work together frequently, say for example, when we were blowing up spaceships, uh, we would need the, the deft um, uh, assistance of the special effects department because they were the guys that had all the cool explosions. And uh, the Dick Brownfield ran the special effects on Voyager, uh, TNG, uh, and 
uh, Rich Ratliff did uh, Enterprise. Uh, so we had really great people that were super cooperative and they were always happy to help us blow stuff up. <laughs> Nice. Now, it's funny. I want to go back to something you just mentioned. You you said his name, Will. I forgot his last name. Will who Tom, the, the door operator. Right. All right. So, Among other things. Oh, okay. Well, I was about to ask you. You know, first of all, how long is the tenure of the door operator? And second of all, I think a lot of people in the chat are just assuming, or or they they want to believe that he went Shh, every time he did it. <laughs> No, he he was <laughs> silent. That was uh, added by our wonderful sound designers in post production. Yes, yeah. So, and, and how long? I mean, it, was that a job that he had for years and years on Star? Well, Trek? that wasn't was... his sole job. He was okay. a member of the special effects department and did all sorts of things. Uh, so that was just one of the things he did. Got it. So I have a question. I'm really curious about this. So, um, cause I'm really interested in how things happen behind the scenes. So this is exactly totally up my alley. Um, you said there was a lot of crossover between special effects and visual effects. Um, where does somebody like you start out in their career? Did you start off knowing this was the type of thing that you wanted to do? Or was it that you started off with something else and that it, it morphed into becoming, um, what it became? Um, I don't think anybody could possibly have predicted a career like mine. I certainly didn't. Um, I started making movies when I was a little boy, and I would even uh, storyboard imaginary movies before I knew what storyboards were. And when I would play with toys, I was always playing that my eye was the camera and I was making movies about the toys. I wasn't acting out the toys. Um, when I saw The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms as a boy, Ray Harryhausen's wonderful uh, stop action work with the dinosaur, um, I read how Ray had done that. And so I made a, I took a cardboard box and cut a hole out of one end and glued some tracing paper on it. And I had a broken eight millimeter projector and so I shot movies of my brother running around screaming, and then I would put toy dinosaurs moving around in the foreground. And so uh, I started doing that young. Um, then in college, I did uh, possibly the first uh, student film at Middlebury College in Vermont, where I went. And uh, I talked them into, I found an old Bolex camera in the basement of the theater. And I did a medieval epic about a peasant trying to elude recapture for a year and a day and shot it in the mountains of Vermont in the winter. It was a great fun. Um, then uh, in after college, I went volunteered for the Peace Corps and went to Thailand, worked in community development, built small dams and bridges and tributaries of the Mekong River. And then did some other work for other uh, government entities. Uh, took a long time off, did a seven month trek in Nepal, mostly alone, went back to Thailand, uh, studied martial arts, directed a Thai language television series, kind of like Sesame Street. So I made the puppets and I did uh, paper animation. I built the animation stand myself um, and uh, did art and architecture jobs. And I guess the highlight was I won the commission one year to design the King's Royal Ball and got to design huge sets on the uh, palace grounds. Wow. <laughs> that's And what's interesting then is you spent a lot of time in parts of Asia. And then I, I see that that has had, well, several places of influence on your work on Star Trek. That, sure. Well, uh, that's where Mok Bara came from because I was able to study uh, a variety of martial arts, and I got to study with some really uh, unique uh, masters who only had four or five students, and they would teach uh, a specialty like a dagger. And in Vientiane, Laos, I studied with the men who would take us to the market. We'd practice slicing sides of beef so we could feel how a blade moves through meat smoothly. Um, and then if you look at uh, external architecture of, say, the Klingons, it's kind of a, you'll see hints of Thai, Lao, and Nepalese architecture in it. So I, I kind of want to come back to catch this up again. Uh, so Allison is asking you about 
um, your time right after college and what what you had studied. So then at a certain point, that gets you back to the U.S. and you find yourself working in the film and television industry. What what, what was that transition there? You said you were directed in Thailand. Right, uh, and I also taught uh, uh, during Peace Corps times, the villagers were busy growing rice during the rainy season. So it, it, during the rainy season, I taught architectural drafting at Kanten University in Thai. And it. so when I came back, um, I, I briefly did uh, kind of BS my way into doing biomedical illustration in New York. Um, <laughs> I got tired of that and got an offer to teach at Cape Cod Community College and taught fine arts drafting, um, graphic design, drawing, painting, studio arts. And a colleague uh, contacted, uh, without my knowing it, uh, Humboldt State University in Arcata, California. And uh, he told the theater film department about me. And so they offered me a, uh, a chance to write my own graduate program. And uh, if I would teach two or three courses every semester. And so I taught um, perspective rendering, uh, Asian theater, um, uh, stuff like that, uh, uh, scen scenic uh, construction, you know, set construction, and uh, got MFAs in film and theater. Uh, okay. And while I was there, um, I had applied for a one-man show through the art department and the students who ran, ran it granted me a one-man show in these little remote galleries around the campus. And Marsha Lucas, who had just been one of the editors on Taxi Driver, came up to do a seminar on film editing. And she happened to walk by a gallery, went in, saw some of my paintings, came and found me and said, are you interested in matte painting? And I said, what's that? And uh, so she explained it and introduced me to Dennis Murin and Alan Maley and Mike Pangrazio at ILM. And... Uh, so they uh, referred me to Universal. And uh, so after graduation, I uh, took a job designing alien architecture and doing matte paintings at uh, Universal Heartland on uh, Buck Rogers in the 25th century and uh, the original Battlestar Galactica. Yes, yeah, so th this is the part that I love. You went from matte painting, what's that? to then doing matte paintings on two Glenn Larson shows at the height of 70s science fiction, Buck Rogers and Battlestar Galactica, uh, which, by the way, I was just watching Buck Rogers the other night uh, because uh, the, the loss of Dorothy Fontana had reminded mosquito me that she me worked on it. What's that? You know, I was swatted a mosquito that was landing on my ear. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> All right. Um, but uh, so I, I have to assume that some of those iconic shots from both shows, like the uh, the frequently used spaceports uh, on Buck Rogers, were uh, were some of your work. Some of my work. Uh, there was another Matt artist there, Jenna Hallman. And uh, the uh, Matt cameraman was David Stipes, who I was able years later to bring on as a supervisor on to Star Trek. And he worked on Voyager and Deep Space Nine. Wow. All right. And uh, the and Universal Heartland was a great um, opportunity uh, because I got to learn with some uh, masters of uh, motion control, miniature photography, and optical printing. We had uh, banks of optical printers, and we had about 85 people working 12 to 16 hours a day to keep up with the, the schedule. And a great mentor was Peter Anderson there, and uh, got to work on uh, The Incredible Shrinking Woman, uh, Cheech and Chong's next movie. Um, and after Heartland, uh, I took a job as uh, art director at Modern Film Effects and got into doing title design and uh, visual effects some more and uh, shooting inserts. Then I was drafted by Cinema Research doing more of the same. And uh, during that time I did uh, title sequences for 118 features and numerous television productions like uh, Hill Street Blues, uh, Deadly Lessons, uh, Master of Darkness, uh, and while I had done a lot of uh, work for Paramount at the time, and Peter Lauritsen, who had been in charge of 
television post-production for the studio, decided to uh, take on the responsibility of post-production for the new Star Trek. And Peter called me and asked me if I would be interested in doing a few storyboards for the up and coming uh, revisiting of uh, Star Trek, Star Trek The Next Generation. So I went over and met Gene uh, and uh, Bob Justman. And uh, their idea was I could, they would do 40 stock shots that would serve all the episodes. And that lasted about a week into the pilot. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, now hang on just a second. I, I, obviously, we're a Star Trek show. We're on the Roddenberry Podcast Network. But I, I, I want to touch on something really quickly before we get deeper into Star Trek. You mentioned your work on title sequences on all these iconic shows. And, of course, you did uh, titles on uh, a couple of the Star Trek series and at least one of the movies that I know of. Yeah, I did Star Trek Four, But other shows you might know, um, Top Gun, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana. Wait, 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 back up. Yeah. <laughs> right? Right? You did, the, you did the title sequences for Top Gun and Raiders of the Lost Ark. And Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and the map sequences on the those films. I have to go somewhere now. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was clearly not enough aware of your prior work because I'm uh, now a little speechless. You're a little verklempt. I'm yeah, a little yeah. verklempt. I'm very, I'm, yes. Well, One of the most fun ones was uh, Back to School, a Rodney Dangerfield uh, Oh, my God. He used to oh love God. that movie. <laughs> with, with Terry Farrell. With Terry Farrell. Terry yeah. was in that, yes. And yeah. uh, what was interesting about that is the uh, the director and the producer wanted me to do a biography of Rodney's character from age 12 to 55. And by a freak coincidence, I grew up in the neighborhood that Rodney's character was supposed to have grown up in. Oh, wow. So wow. The family album and took, uh, re-photographed some of the old pictures. And we didn't have Photoshop yet. So I do photoreal oil paintings of Rodney's face over my father's face in a lot of the shots. And then I would do uh, just painted by hand on uh, photographs of street scenes, uh, tall and fat store signs. and. Right. The other interesting thing about that was normally the composer will have the uh, the visuals to work with or uh, the title designer will have the music to work with, say like on Top Gun, for example. Um, in, uh, in this case, uh, the composer was Danny Elfman and we were both starting on the same day on the same schedule. So we couldn't really work to each other's work. So uh, Danny Elfman was kind enough to invite me over to his house and he played on the piano what he had in mind for the theme song, bum, 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 bum. And he said, well, let's go 15 frames a beat. And he said, can you read music? And I said, sure. And so he gave me the keyboard uh, score. And um, so I went through it mathematically. And then if I'd see a glissando, I'd say, oh, that's a good point for a swish pan. And so... I edited everything mathematically. And when we went to look at the final result, we both of us feared that it wouldn't work, that the sync wouldn't be good. And our take one is in the movie. And we both laughed when it was done and everybody looked at us like, well, what, did you do something? Said, no, no, we're just happy it's done. Wow. It's wonderful. Wow. Out of curiosity, do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite title sequence? That, that you ever worked on? I know it's a lot uh, to choose from. <laughs> not really. There's, I have favorites, hmm. but uh, I wouldn't say there's a, a single one that stands out. Maybe uh, the title sequences uh, I equally uh, am proud of, uh, the uh, Voyager and Deep Space Nine title sequences. Huh. Hmm. I, solid yeah, choices. One thing I should point out before we get too far along is there... There's no single hero of Star Trek visual effects. Uh, the first seasons uh, through Next Generation, beginning of DS9, Rob Legato and I alternated episodes, and we had great support from our coordinators, uh, Ron Moore working with me and Gary Hutzel working with Rob. Uh, we had David Takamura as the associate who kept everything in order. And we had a great team of compositors, motion control uh, camera operators and riggers, 
So, um, and our compositing editors were really terrific. And for me, it was difficult because I came from the world of op optical printers. And when Paramount started Next Generation, they made it a really courageous decision to not have a final product as a film negative, but to do uh, the, the compositing in those days, one inch analog. Yeah. And so uh, I would say when anybody considers Star Trek visual effects, what they really need to understand is that it's the product of an army of really dedicated artists and technicians who uh, really devoted uh, above and beyond uh, loyalty to making Star Trek uh, greater than the sum of its parts. That's uh, all true and and very gracious and uh, and uh, yeah, uh, lovely of you to say to recognize uh, so many of the talented people who who work uh, with you behind the scenes. Um, I, I do want to mention that uh, well, here it is at the bottom of the hour. We actually don't have an ad this week, but I I, I do want to do something uh, a little bit commercial with you and just point out that you've got a book coming out. Um, it, it's not. Not super soon. I don't know if people can pre-order it yet on Amazon. No, I don't think so. Uh, okay. It's September 2020. Oh, okay. So we have a little ways to go. Yeah, so and, everybody. Uh, and I'm working with a wonderful co-author, uh, Ben Robinson, who uh, is London-based and the, the publisher is Titan Books. And it will be available on Amazon. And Ben's been uh, super patient and uh He's an experienced writer where I'm a novice. And uh, uh, with Ben's guidance and uh, graciousness, it was uh, uh, a wonderful experience. And Ben uh, contacted a lot of uh, people on the show who made little uh, commentary about uh, working with me and working with the visual effects on the show. So there are little anecdotes in that. And then I did a lot of special illustrations uh, of things like, you know, showing how we would do a setup to make uh, blowing up a model look like it happens in zero gravity and stuff like that. So uh, it's written for uh, the lay person uh, so they didn't get too technical in how things were, were done, but gives them an idea of some of the wacko uh, approaches we used to uh, accomplish things before um, uh, everything was done on the computer. So that book is called Star Trek, The Artistry of Dan Curry. We have it up on screen uh, for those of you who are not watching but listening. Uh, mm -hmm. Look for that next September of 2020. Uh, I set a reminder in your calendar. It is by Dan Curry and uh, noted Star Trek expert Ben Robinson, who we know from Eagle Moss and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of his fabulous uh, Star Trek research that he has done through Yeah, that. I couldn't have had a better partner to work with. He was really great. He's a, a pretty exceptional guy. Um, but we have so much to get to. I, I, I'm, I think I'm like Allison here. I'm just kind of hung up on titles at the moment because that's <laughs> just incredibly cool. And I have about 900 questions about that. I do want to go to uh, one of our listeners, though, uh, Chris, who is in the chat. And he asked what I, I think is a, a very pertinent question. Are there slash were there uh, elements that had to be there to make something Star Trek? I mean, you're you're working in science fiction. You're working in all these different uh, creative genres, and it seems like in sci-fi, really, just the the sky's the limit. You can be as creative as you want to be, but it seems like there are certain hallmarks or design elements that, uh, to Chris's point, maybe just have to be there to make it track. Well, uh, first of all, uh, the visual effects sole reason for existence is to support the stories. And so everything stems from uh, from the story, as we would all say, story is king. Uh, when designing, say, ships, we tended to want to imply that there's a, like in the days of sailing ships, you had a boat with a mast and a sail on it, and that would drive the thing. So we tended to have a technology with uh, warp drive. So all the Starfleet ships tended to have two nacelles with glowing blue lights. And uh, then, uh, so a lot of the different cultures we assumed would stumble upon the same technology for uh, faster than light travel in space. So that would make it Star Trek. Um, and there was a certain aesthetic and uh, we always consulted with uh, our great production designers 
Herman Zimmerman and Richard James and those guys uh, were geniuses in their own right. And, uh, and they were supported by great uh, art departments. And uh, so uh, I think one of the wonderful things for me on Star Trek is it was a home where my range of goofy skills had value. Um, and the because of the graciousness of our uh, production designers, they let me do a lot of design work that would normally remain the purview of their department. So that, say, on uh, Enterprise, I designed uh, pretty much all the CG creatures. And, uh, and Herman and uh, Richard had no objections when I would design that want to design an alien ship or, or a, a Federation ship, or they didn't have any problems if I wanted to uh, work with the, uh, either do my own matte painting or work with great matte painters like Sid Dutton to do uh, exterior architecture for various cultures. And so um, I had an immense amount of uh, freedom and that was the result of the graciousness of, of Herman and Richard. Um, you mentioned something within that, uh, the, the, you kind of hit on the, the CG work that you did, and here you were coming from doing matte painting early in your career to all kinds of uh, visual effects techniques that you used throughout your tenure at, uh, at Star Trek. And um, in my mind, you know, uh, technologies and techniques, of course, are always changing, always evolving. Uh, but you, and particularly at Star Trek, you happen to occupy this very specific time when these analog techniques are giving way to CG. And I'm curious uh, for you, you know, did you, did you see this as a sudden thing? Was it gradual? Uh, did you have pushback to that? Or did you see it as like, oh, look, here's one more tool in my arsenal to do this? Or do you now say, like, you know what, that's something that I could do better or more effectively with an analog effect? Well, the evolution from alchemy to algorithms uh, was a, a slow process. Um, we began to experiment with it uh, on Next Generation. I guess the crystal entity was our first foray into that. And because it was something that would have been so difficult to shoot with motion control to get a transparent model uh, that would uh, we'd be actually be able to shoot on a motion control stage uh, because of the reflection problems and reflecting the rig and reflecting the camera. And when CG started to come along, it was, uh, it didn't look that good. There were, you could tell that there were textures stretched over shapes and stuff. So we tended to put, uh, when we started embracing CG uh, on Deep Space Nine and Voyager, we tended to keep those ships in the background. So we did a lot of hybrid work where the foreground ships were the physical models that looked great. And they were built by great model makers like Greg Jean and Tony Meininger. And the background ships would be uh, less noticeable because your eye was looking at the foreground and you just kind of accept that they're there in the background, but they you weren't paying as much attention to them as the foreground. And everybody saw the potential. Uh, David Stipes and Rob uh, were uh, proponents of moving into CG and embracing it as much as we can. And there were great pioneers, uh, Ron Thornton from Foundation Imaging and John Gross at the time was Amblin Imaging. And then his company evolved into with different names, but same similar core people. And those pioneers uh, on Sequest and Babylon 5 uh, got our interest in, in using CG because say to do a simple flyby with a, a miniature would take all day. To do something really complicated could take several days. So when we would get scripts that required multiple ships in the same shot, it was physically impossible to do that. Uh, and, and keep up uh, on schedule. So th that's why we began to embrace um, CG work. And as computing power got better and the software got better, 
uh, we used it more and more until we finally got to Enterprise, which was the first series we did that had no physical models. I'm actually really curious about the interplay between all those things that you talked about. So you have you got the script on one side, you've got the the practical limitations of what you can or cannot shoot. You've also got the um, technological limitations of how good or not good the CGI model looks. Um, can you talk about your experience and weighing those things off against each other. So if you have a script where the action is just, you just can't do it, or what allowances do you make for, um, we'd prefer this one to be physical or we want this one to be CGI. What's your thought process while you're in the process of creating it? Uh, we just did the best we could as fast as possible. Um, <laughs> so uh, time was a consideration. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And one of the elements, uh, there were a couple of elements that we used a lot. Uh, one was, uh, if you saw, uh, diverting a little bit, but I wanted to talk about these. Um, if you saw the Enterprise get hit, you'd see a little kind of splash of energy. Or if you'd see the force field around the Enterprise or Deep Space Nine, it would be this kind of semi-invisible uh, sparkly thing. Those were actually a mylar uh, cheerleaders pom-pom I shook over a mirror and Gary Hutzel shot with an old Mitchell rack over camera. And so by taking this random kinetic uh, particulate energy, uh, I stumbled upon it in a dry goods store and uh, the pom-pom was in almost every episode of Next Generation and even found itself as part of the energy cone in the temporal chamber of uh, uh, Star Trek Enterprise. And another one we used a lot was liquid nitrogen, which was our savior. And liquid nitrogen is heavier than, than air, so it, it sinks so you can control it in a vat. There was an, an episode where we did a, um, the enterprise has to clean the polluted atmosphere from a planet. And so we used liquid nitrogen in a vat uh, about four feet by four feet, about five inches deep, lined with black velvet. We put the liquid nitrogen vapors in it and then just swatted it with pieces of cardboard. The puff of air would make the the liquid nitrogen separate and come back together again. And we use that for um, uh, energy hitting that planet's atmosphere. And interestingly enough, uh, sometime later, I used it on a Michael Jackson music video, Black or White, where Michael is on a treadmill singing and he keeps going like this. And each time he does that, uh, put, presses his hands apart, he wipes into a new reality. And I used the liquid nitrogen from that episode for uh, as wiping elements in black or white. So I, I guess that's what I'm saying here is you, you still, look, a computer can do anything. You can design whatever you want. You can give it whatever properties you want. Um, but there's still this sort of joy in discovering uh, almost the, the accidental effect. You go, oh, I can get some liquid nitrogen, some cardboard, a particular type of camera, and, and get this really amazing effect, uh, A, for very little money, um, and, and B, kind of be surprised by what I end up with instead of, you know, literally designing and drawing out every single pixel where I want it. Um, do you... Do you still see a place for that? or It, 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 it hasn't gone away. Uh, we call those organic elements. And sometimes they, um, you know, they have a natural randomness about them that makes them attractive. But uh, computer software just gets better and better and better. And they are able to break down phenomenon to individual pixels. So, um, but it, it's still fun. And uh, a lot of people... Uh, like to do it because it's it's great fun. I have a, I have a personal question. Well, it's not that personal. It's a little bit personal. Uh, you as a creator, because you talked a lot about your history and how you kind of uh, organically evolved into the roles that you did then in Hollywood. Um, are are you still on that path? Do you still have the list in, you know, that mental list in your mind of all of the things that you want to try out or do or or you see something and you want to make an effect out of that? Does is that still is that still going on? Are you still doing yeah, that? And what's your next step? It's as natural as breathing. 
Um, <laughs> That's wonderful. That's really I wonderful. Mean, it, it just, it's just, it is what it is. It's like why I still paint and draw every day and uh, just got to do it. And uh, I've also invented uh, the types of ergonomic electric guitars, which uh, uh, working with one of my uh, friends uh, who was one of our animators on Star Trek, who uh, Brandon McDougall, who became a violin maker and luthier. And I had this idea about ergonomics on a guitar. And uh, Brandon uh, had been making exquisite guitars for a while. So I said, hey, Brandon, I had this idea. And I sent him a few sketches. And uh, Brandon thought it was uh, really uh, uh, a cool idea. He said, well, let's make some and see how they work. So we did. And uh, and Brandon is a, uh, a phenomenal luthier, uh, guitar maker. And so uh, now that I'm done with the book, I'm going to devote some time in the future trying to uh, make something happen with these guitars that we created. Well, I, so all right, between guitars and a book about your work, I mean, what else are you doing now? Uh, are, are the have other creative projects? I would assume yes. Yeah. Well, I want to get uh, uh, back more seriously into fine arts. I've been saving materials for sculpture, and I've been wanting to do like we used to do. Uh, you know, when I would do the alien ship of the week, when we had no money, I'd glue a couple of toy submarines onto a shampoo bottle, and that would be the. Uh, uh, one of them sold for almost two hundred thousand dollars at Christie's. What? <laughs> and uh, the uh, so I, I when I was doing Star Trek, I'd walk into a, a hardware store, and I would not look at hardware. I was looking at spaceship parts, so right. I could see a sleeve for repairing sprinkler systems, and it had a cool high tech uh, design on it. So I used that as a uh, an a, a, an escape pod. And uh, so uh, I, I just, maybe it's from playing with toys as a boy. Uh, I don't look at things as what they are, but I look at things as independent of their actual purpose and their scale and just see them for something else. Now, now you mentioned that, uh, or I, I'm sorry, you, you mentioned that you, you designed and built all these starships. I mentioned earlier that there is a USS Curry yeah, uh, named after you. You designed it. You built it. Please tell me you got to keep it. Yeah, I do have that. Okay, good. So yeah, it did not end up in an auction somewhere. No, okay. they. Uh, uh, it was for a special episode where there was a uh, a ragtag fleet of starship uh, Federation ships that survived the battle, and they were all beat up. So a lot of people in the department we kept it at Image G where we shot our motion control. We just had boxes and boxes of. Star Trek models, which had come out. And so we would just put them together the wrong way, kit bashing. Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, there are a lot of uh, SS somebody or others named after the people that built it. Uh, uh, you mean a ragtag fugitive fleet fly, fleeing the Cylon tyranny looking for a lost planet known as Earth. Wait, I'm, I'm crossing wires oh, yeah, it's here. Curious, I'm it's a different series. Different show, different show. Hey, uh, we have Matthew uh, waiting on the line very patiently. Uh, Matthew... Welcome to the show. Hello to you. And uh, please say hi to our guest, Dan. Hi, Matthew. Hi, uh, question I was going to ask you. So, I, you know, I, I think when the visuals are created, you're, you're basically doing, you know, I, from my experience of watching the show, is as much world building as the writers are doing because you're creating those worlds and making them visual and, and real. And I was wondering, when, when audiences are stepping back out of that to the real world, what is it that you're hoping that you're take they're taking with them when they step back into reality again? Is there something in particular to each of the shows or is it something more in general um, that you're hoping audiences will bring back to the world after being in the fictional world that you've helped to visualize for them? Well, I think we didn't really have a lot of time to do it because we're racing with the clock to think about uh, the audience consequences. But our goal was, as I mentioned earlier, to serve the story, but also to delight the audience and and create a world or even a universe where these stories could unfold in, in a convincing way. So our goal was that the audience would walk away uh, having enjoyed it, uh, maybe being inspired by the vision we created, but it's really the stories and uh, 
And what they mean that was what made Star Trek greater than the sum of its parts. Well, uh, thank ask you. Matthew, any other questions or uh, thoughts before we let you go tonight? Uh, no, thanks. I just, Dan, I just wanted to thank you. I know that, I mean, Star Trek was, was Star Trek, but it's, um, you know, it's one thing to have the sets, but it's the exterior visuals that brought the whole world to make it feel like there was a wider world outside that the, that the ships were actually exploring. So thank you very much for your work. Oh, thank you for appreciating it. Thanks, Matthew. Have a good night. You too. All right. And one thing I, uh, um, I brought was uh, this is Batleth number one. Whoa. <gasps> Whoa. All right. Made so for those of you who are listening, yeah, if you're listening only and not watching the video, uh, switch over and download the video because uh, that is Batleth number one that uh, Dan is holding. Yeah, actually, the first one was Foam Core, which no longer exists, but this is the first metal one. Wow. Well, that was cool. <laughs> um, hold that thought for a second. And uh, uh, we're just going to take uh, one minute to talk about what else is on RPN. Allison, if you would, please. Yeah, sure. We've got a number of awesome Star Trek shows uh, and one non-Star Trek show uh, on the Roddenberry Podcast Network. So I'm going to start off with Mission Log, which if you are watching this show, you probably are aware of Mission Log, but you might not be. Uh, <laughs> I hope. I yeah. Hope um, John and uh, and Ken are looking at, uh, well, formerly Ken, are looking at uh, each episode of Star Trek in sequence and, and judging it for morals, messages, and meanings. And you've got a special episode coming up this Thursday, don't you? We do. Well, it, it, it's uh, me and Rod talking about kind of the state of the state of Star Trek, the state of podcasts. And we do have a little bit of a, a memorial talking about some of the uh, people that we've lost recently. And then I'm really excited about uh, the interview that Ken and I did with uh, John DeLancey coming up next Thursday, the 19th. Yep, that's right. Uh, we've got Priority One Podcast, which is a sort of a magazine format. It's about an hour long, and they talk about the big news stories of the week from all across the Star Trek multiverse, including um, including gaming as well. So if you're a gamer, tune into that. Uh, also, they have a live show before this one, which you can't watch live now because... <laughs> That was in the past. Not live. But you, not live, but you can still watch it. It's on Facebook and YouTube and a number of other places. And their uh, edited show comes out on Friday. And then we got Women at Warp, which is bi-weekly, and it's looking at Star Trek from a feminist perspective. They've actually got a, a, a special episode that came out yesterday or Monday looking at um, uh, DC Fontana and Rene Aubergenois and their legacies. We've got the Trek Files with Larry Nemechek and a special guest are looking at some historical documents that have to do with Star Trek. It's a great show, so you should check that one out. Uh, you got me, Daily Star Trek News. I do Star Trek News daily. Um, <laughs> about <laughs> then, Star Trek, oddly. About, about yeah. Star Trek. Um, and also some other things. There's, there's things that would be of interest to Star Trek fans in there. Um, and of course, the newest member of the Rodberry Podcast Network is Shabam. And it's Shabam. a science... Shabam! <laughs> it's all about avoiding brain traps. Um, it's a science-based show uh, for kids of all ages. Um, and they're currently in their connections where they're taking two things that don't seem like they would be connected and uh, working out how they are related to one another. Uh, so go and have a listen to all of those shows. They are all available at podcast.roddenberry.com. So podcast.roddenberry.com. You can listen to all of those shows in one convenient place. Well said. And by the way, you mentioned... Um, you mentioned Women at Warp and mm -hmm. uh, their discussion about Dorothy and Renee. I was so pleased. Not only uh, have they been covering this uh, in depth and, and with a great deal of heart and thought, uh, really pleased to see that Jara Hodge, one of the hosts on Women at Warp, was invited by NPR's All Things Considered to talk about Dorothy and her impact on Star Trek. Uh, that, that was just excellent to uh, to see women at warp get that kind of attention and to be able to talk about somebody who is so important uh so check that out as well as you check out women at warp uh give a look at the episode of uh, npr's all things considered came out uh end of last week i want to say we've all cataloged it on all of our various social media uh 
Now, uh, Allison, since you mentioned, and, and we've uh, obviously had on our minds uh, the loss of uh, so many people in the Star Trek family, um, we're, we're lucky to have Dan here who worked with Rene for the entirety of DS9's run. And uh, Dan, I wonder if you could just uh, share a little bit about him and uh, what he was like and, uh, you know, tell us about your friendship with him. Well, Rene was a consummate actor, totally professional, uh, a yoga master, which a lot of people don't know. And uh, he had an amazing collection of masks. And uh, I remember looking at them one, with him one time and he said that, well, he makes his living wearing a mask. So that's one of the reasons he collects them. And he was a wonderful photographer. And just every minute I spent with him, I would learn something. And he was so urbane, urbane and had this giant intellect. And I, I would always walk, walk away feeling a little bit smarter than I was before I encountered him that day. Wow. So and, uh, did he, uh, obviously you're working on visual effects. He He's there in his capacity as an actor. Did he take an interest in what you were doing? Did he take an interest? Of course, in because he was a visual effect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, yes, yes, morphing, he was. which was pioneered by Rob Legato for the first season of uh, Deep Space Nine, and that was done at uh, Vision Art, and uh, then everybody, uh, each story, uh, Odo would morph into something different, so that the various supervisors uh, uh, would. Uh, Come up with a new thing for Odo to do, but it was, uh, uh, and Rene was really interested because he was uh, he was curious about everything. Uh, as I mentioned, he had this great intellect that was uh, never satisfied, and he always wanted to learn more and do more. And he always conducted himself on the set with uh, total pre preparedness and. Uh, worked well with the uh, with the entire crew he was very popular because he was just a really decent person that it, it's nice to hear that and and i'm seeing uh carlos here in the chat just saying he was one of the sweetest people and that is a word that keeps coming back that he, he just had this really kind warm sweet disposition and yeah, i would uh, sweet doesn't come right to mind uh, uh, <laughs> uh, i rarely use that as an adjective uh, for anything other than food um <laughs> uh, but he certainly was uh, kind and uh, just wonderful to be around and uh, i remember we did a special show where odo and quark were uh, up in the mountains and we were shooting in the Alabama Hills of, near Lone Pine, California. And uh, they had a, they were supposed to carry something, but they, it was, I forget it was invisible or what. So I had this idea of just making thread so that Armin and Renee would keep their hands uh, in perfect uh, position all the time by having a thread which didn't register on camera to hold their hands in the right place. And they were always excited to get involved with what we were doing and they, they uh, were eager to cooperate. And uh, so I, I always appreciated, especially their, especially Renee's interest in, in doing what we needed to make, make the shots work in, in post-production. Well, see, it's a good thing you have actors who who are that engaged and interested in the process and what you're doing. The the other extreme is, you know, you, you hear about people there, they've been doing something for years and years and years, and it, but the added difficulty of heavy prosthetics and then waiting around for effect shots and, and all of this, it, it, it's very difficult. It's very strenuous work for for people to maintain their uh, their good humor and their professionalism is pretty excellent to be uh, to be friendly and warm as they were and interested as they were. That, that, that just, it makes working a pleasure. Yeah. And also uh, having to memorize that much dialogue every day. Yeah. And you mentioned next week uh, you're going to have John Delancey on. He's also uh, one of the greats, a wonderful person to work with, really generous. Um, and uh, so that should be an exciting thing and uh, John's knowledge of uh, classical music is uh, also profound. 
see, we didn't even get into that. We, we talked about sailing. We talked about travel. We and there's just so much you barely scratched the surface uh, with John Delancey. So we, we need to have him come back about ten more times. Yeah, and his son is in the Foreign Service. Yeah, right. It's yeah, uh, the exceptional family. Um, Dan, I feel like we're at the same place here with you, where uh, we're up against the clock, and I have about 900 more questions, 899 of which are about Raiders of the Lost Ark and the titles and the airplane sequence. So the only thing we can do is have you back and have Allison back, and we do this again sometime, um, and we check in on you on the progress on the book and everything else that you're doing. Well, okay, and uh, I thank the uh, the listeners for tuning in and, and your interest in uh, what we're doing. And uh, I'll just leave that last note. Uh, you know, the visual effects on Star Trek are the result of lots and lots of people. And I'm not not the hero of visual effects. I'm just one of the people that was fortunate enough to be in a leadership position on it. Well, everybody, thank you for saying that. And everybody now, Carlos already more Dan. So they already want more Dan. So we, we can't let our audience down. Allison, anything to be aware of uh, with you and with DSTN coming up other than uh, everybody subscribe and check it out tomorrow morning? Uh, no, it's going to be a fun one tomorrow, actually. Okay. there. So yeah, because we, you know, Star Trek news sometimes can be a little bit dry, sometimes can be a little bit depressing, uh, but today's stories are a little bit more upbeat and a little bit more fun. So hopefully you'll get a little bit of that too. Um, but yeah, mostly make sure you come and follow us on us. I always say that, me, follow me <laughs> on uh, social media because each of the channels is slightly different, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and Facebook. It's all daily Trek news. Um, and yeah, come and join the fun. It's, uh, it's a good place to be, I think. Great. Okay. Well, uh, look, already Paul saying, yes, more Dan and Allison, please. <laughs> so there we go. We, we can't let our audience down. With that said, Mission Log Live is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment, executive producer Rod Roddenberry. Technical production on Mission Log Live by the incomparable Earl Green. Be sure to visit podcast.roddenberry.com for the latest from the Roddenberry Podcast Network. Not just Mission Log on Mission Log Live, but Women at Warp, Priority One, The Trek File, Shabam. Oh, wait, and did we say it? Daily Star Trek News. If you would like to support Mission Log directly, give us a look at patreon.com slash mission log. By the way, behind the scenes videos going up there of uh, the Rod Roddenberry episode and the John Delancey episode. So enjoy those coming up soon. Thank you to everyone who joined us live or later. And we will talk to you next week.